Hello and welcome. I'm Stephanie Riggs and you're watching Vista TV's Movers and Shakers. Our guest today has been shaking things up, you might say, spiritually for the last 40 years. She has shared her message in more than 124 nations over two generations. Every day, more than two billion viewers welcome her into their home. And the whole show is shot right here in Denver. These are the people who shake up the town of Denver. These are Vista's movers and shakers. I want to welcome Marilyn Hickey to Movers and Shakers. Thank you, Stephanie. It's a delight to be with you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. You do spend quite a bit of time traveling around the world, don't you? I do. I just came back from Costa Rica and Panama, and then next month I go to Indonesia. Why is it so important for you to get on the road like you do? Well, I am called, you know, spiritually called by the Lord to cover the earth with the Word. Well, how do you do that? When He spoke that to me, I was 42 years old. Now I'm 78 and a half, you know, doing this. And when he called me to do that, I, how, how would you ever do that? But I have found with God, uh, things are process. So I started here with radio. The radio began to grow. Then I got involved in television on Sunday mornings on Channel 9. And then I got involved in daily television. And now, of course, the satellites, the networks, they go all over the world. And the internet. Oh, awesome, awesome. So people have such needs in these countries, and so I feel uh, very much a part of bringing Jesus to nations around the world. Now, you started on Channel 9 when, let me tell you, n no one was really doing right. this, especially a woman. Right. Well, I started, I went down, I was on radio, and Sarah would have been about three years old, right in there. This is your daughter. My yeah. daughter, and uh, they said, uh, well, you're not television material, you should stay with radio and it was nine men on a board. So this one man spoke up and said, oh, I think we ought to try her. I think she'll pay her bill. <laughs> now, who was doing this at the time, talking about Jesus and God on television? Uh, not very many people. Oral Roberts was on on Sunday mornings. Uh, Pastor Blair, Charles Blair here at Calvary Temple, he was. And of course, we saw Billy Graham on occasion. So I don't know of any others. So really, they were moving in an unknown area. But we were on Channel 9 for eight years, paid our bill, got top religious awards, and uh, I thought, isn't it interesting, after all these years on television, none of those men are involved, and I'm still very much involved all around the world. Now, I wasn't around the world then. Well, and Oral Roberts specifically requested for you to give the eulogy, and no one else. Right, right, that's a miracle to me, and very touching to me. A couple weeks before he died, uh, I got a call saying Oral Roberts would like you to do his funeral. So, you know, that was quite an honor to me. What did you say in a nutshell? A nutshell. I talked about Oral's altars and how he built altars in the presence of God and how altars demand sacrifice and how sacrificial his life was, but how miraculous. Because when you build an altar and you put a sacrifice on it, the fire falls. So, you know, he really brought healing, the healing message of Jesus to the whole world. Now, did he tell you what he wanted you to say? No, He just no, said, I no. want you to be the... No, he just asked. You're my girl, he said. Oh, yeah. So I prayed a lot. I had, I said, I had everybody in his dog pray for me. Well, because it was televised and you had oh, yeah. Fox and... Shown again and again, and we had news people there and everything. But you know, Stephanie, when people pray for you, I didn't feel just real distraught and upset. I was quite comfortable. So that's a miracle too. Marilyn, are you ever afraid, fearful, your family ever afraid of you going into these Muslim countries and talking about Jesus? I don't think they are so much now, but when I first did it 13 or 14 years ago, I think they were very frightened and I, I had fear too. I mean, how are they going to receive a message about Jesus, you know, coming in and, and praying for the sick and so on, but I found them very, very open. So the first night we had like 4,000. By the fourth night we had over 20,000. And I went back to the same city in 2003 
and we had over 120,000 in a stadium. The word got around, I, I take it. The word got around, and uh, again, most of this audience, probably 80% would be Muslim. But the thing that really touches them is Jesus heals. This is in the Quran. So when you teach healing, and then I prayed for the sick, and on, you know, we put all this on DVD, of course. Uh, I had a little girl who was born with a crooked foot that straightened out, uh, a boy whose hand was frozen closed from polio, his hand opened up. Uh, we had a lot of children with blind eyes who were healed, uh, deaf ears. So, you know, what can you say? It was a five-night meeting. Every night, it just seemed like it went to another level. When I say the word got around, the word got around that this, this unusual woman from Denver, Colorado flew in here and she started talking about this healing business and next thing you know, this is all taking place so people wanted to come out of curiosity, you think, or what do you think? Uh, no, they come out of need. Stephanie, they believe Jesus heals. They believe it more than American Christians probably believe it. And they have heard that, read that, and they're very desperate. I mean, they don't have insurance, they don't have a lot of doctors, and so they're desperate to get healed. Now, do they know it's not you, or do you, does it, is it hard for you to kind of be humble in this whole program? Well, uh, you don't want to walk out into the audience. Not that they would hurt you, but they would try to touch you. They would squish you, you know. So I don't think it is because you're up on a platform uh, ministering the Bible, ministering healing. It's only Jesus. It's not my name that heals anyone. It's the name of Jesus that heals. And then I invite them to know Jesus. And, you know, I don't say convert. I just say you can know him. So many of them pray and invite Jesus to be real to them. And so I haven't had a problem in those five times. I've had some threats, you know, of what they could do. But the meetings themselves are powerful. Have you always been like this, Marilyn Hickey? <laughs> uh, no, not really. I was a foreign language teacher here at South High, at Grant Junior High. Uh, when God called me, it just seemed like he put a great boldness, great anointing. And I love doing this. You know, next month I go to Indonesia. I go to another Muslim country. No, but I mean, when you were a little girl, did you grow up? Did, did you know Jesus as a little girl? I mean, how did this all happen? When I was 16, I went to a youth camp. And I knew about Jesus. I was raised in a church. So your mom and dad were both just like you? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they took me to church. We would say maybe nominal Christians. What uh, does that mean? Well, just kind of. Uh, this is Easter the thing, and Christmas. This kind is of thing? the thing to do. Go to church. I mean, they were moral people. They taught us good values. But when I was 16 in this youth camp, a minister was speaking, and he said, "You can have Jesus in your heart. You can not just know about him, but you can have him." So I prayed that prayer, and that prayer has absolutely transformed my life. From 16 to 78 and a half, the prayer is still working, and that prayer is very simple. I just told the Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Uh, I repent of all the wrong things I have done. I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins and arose from the dead. Come into my heart, and thank you for saving me. And that simple prayer, that's when it all started. And you've never sinned since, right? <laughs> I have prayed, of course, every day about, you know, my relationship with him. So it's a daily thing you have to do. Uh, well, I think a one-time thing he comes in. I but see. a daily thing in your fellowship with him. So that's what I would say. Reading my Bible, uh, you know, really uh, letting him talk to me in my heart. I've never heard the audible voice of God, but that still small voice inside me, so sweet, so wonderful sometimes correcting, directing, you know, dealing with me the way I deal with my family, all kinds of things. So when you are on these flights, you always talk about, you spend a lot of time on airline flights. Here, dab your eye really fast. Yes, yes. And you're on the flights. You say, um, you, you get a little bit uh, uneasy when you're on these flights sitting next to passengers and they say, so what do you do for a living, Marilyn Hickey? You know, you say, my yeah. name's Marilyn Hickey. They yeah. say, what do you do for a living? And you say, why do you always do that? Uh, I don't, that doesn't bother me. That's a good opener. Because usually I ask them, what do you do? And they will say, well, you know, well, I'll tell you an incident. This man said, well, I'm a rancher in Colorado. What do you do? Well, that's my opportunity. 
I said, well, I teach the Bible on television. Really? I said, really? He's, I said, I go all over the world because our program goes all over the world. And he said, how did you get into this? And I say, just what you asked me. Well, I prayed one prayer when I was 16. And this man said to me, well, could you tell me the prayer? And I said, yes, I can tell you the prayer. And then he began to cry. He said, you know, I've been diagnosed with cancer. I'm 54 years old, and I believe I was supposed to sit by you. Could you give me the prayer again? And so it, it, that's heartwarming to me, Stephanie, those kind of opportunities. So I like one-to-one. -one. I like big crusades. I like church meetings. I like Bible studies, as you know. Well, then what if somebody says, you know, oh, that's nice. Good for you. I'm going to go back to my... Uh my, my paper here. You just, you just mind your own business, yeah. Miss Bible Teacher. And I let them mind. I don't try to push anything or press them. I open the door, and then I let the Holy Spirit lead me. And if it's not open, I don't worry about it. I can always pray for them. So you just think it's a relationship, not a religion? It's absolutely a relationship. It is not a religion. Because I go to all these different religions, but this is a relationship. You know, I think what's so compelling uh, about you is how you just never get tired. <laughs> I mean, you're almost 80 years old, and I ask you, you know, do you have jet lag? You just came back from Costa Rica last night, and you said, oh, no, I have grace. I think, is she kidding me? <laughs> well, Costa Rica is only an hour's difference, so the time change is good. I, I wouldn't have jet lag, but You're the almost energy. 80 years old. I, I don't want to remind you, but... <laughs> Well, I think God, when God calls you to do something, he gives you the energy and the strength to do it. And, you know, people say to me, well, when are you going to retire? I said, well, I am retired. They said, what do you mean? You're traveling all the time. I said, I know. Retirement means doing what you like. I'm doing what I like. I love it. But I do believe God energizes you for what he's called you to do. That's very important. And what has he called you to do? He called me to cover the earth with the word. So how do I do that? Uh, I do that with books. I have a lot of books out. Uh, I do that with television. I do that with meetings, traveling all over the world. Uh, I do it if in any means I can get it out there, with radio, whatever. And we live in a wonderful time. Look at internet and all the ways we can do it. All right, you just said you do that with books. This is just a little <laughs> right. sampling. I mean, we could fill right. almost a library with the pamphlets and whatnot. Yeah. Do you just stay up all night? And where do you have the time to raise your children, give all these lectures, go around the world, write all these books? Really, well, what is wrong children. with you, Marilyn Hickey? What is wrong with you? <laughs> You're not normal. My children are grown. No, I'm not normal. I'm supernatural. But what does that mean? That means I have Jesus in my heart and I have his life. So that's the way I can do this is through Christ. That's the big key is I don't do it through Marilyn Hickey. I do it through Jesus Christ. And books, let me tell you, books are easy because when I teach, they, you know, what do they do? They tape all that. And so then if I do a series like on healing, Be Healed, that's the first book there, uh, then they take it all and work with it, and then I read it, and we put a book out. So a book is not a big deal. <laughs> don't, don't make that big. It's not. All right. Uh, you know, uh, let me ask you, of all these books, do you have a favorite? Yes, I do. Which one? The Names of God. Hold on. Here it is. Yeah. I, I love that book, and I love to teach it. I like to do television series on that because there are so many names of God that reveal his character. For example, one of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha. That means the Lord, our healer. And so I go to the context of where he reveals himself as the Lord, our healer. And then I find the word even means health. So he can heal you and keep you healthy. So those names reveal his provisions. What do you say to people who are watching right now and thinking, I want to be healed so much? And I'm praying and it's just not happening. Yes. What do you say to them? Uh, this is what I would say to them, don't give up. Because uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I feed my faith all the time because I read the Bible all the time. I even memorize you know, a lot of it. And so that energizes my faith. And I think when you're ready to give up many times is because 
You just go read the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See how one-third of Jesus' ministry was healing. He preached, he taught, and he healed. And believe him that he paid the price for you to be well. He took our sins, but he also took our sicknesses. I call it the double cure. Don't give up. Some, some healing is very processed. It doesn't come instantly. Now, you always say that God shows up in a crisis. Well, <laughs> why in the world would God let us get into these crises in the first place? Why did he allow it? Because we made wrong choices a lot of times. So, and because there is a devil in the world who, you know, is against anything with God. I mean, people don't recognize there is a devil. Come on, Satan. And he hates the things of God, hates for us to get near to God. So uh, when we have these crises, uh, we have promises in the Bible to help take us through the crisis. And believe me, I've had crises overseas, you know, going to a lot of different countries, you can imagine. I have had crises. But I've, show, I've found out God just shows up and shows off. He is so wonderful. Do you have a story? A good story? <laughs> I, I have a funny thing in Bahrain. I don't know if it's a real uh, critical thing. But I went to Bahrain, a little tiny country by Saudi Arabia, only 300,000 people. So I'm having a healing meeting there in this Muslim country. I get off the plane. I'm walking down to get my luggage. And this woman, all covered in black, comes up to me and says, perfect English. Well, where is Sarah? Well, my television program has both me and Sarah, my daughter, on it. And I'm so shocked at her. I said, well, how do you know Sarah? And she looked at me like I was an idiot. Well, she said, I watch television, and you're on television with her. Like, uh, what's the problem? So you see these things going on. And I, I think one of the most, this is real, real way out there, Stephanie. One of the most unusual miracles I saw in Budapest, Hungary. I prayed for people, and Budapest is not a Muslim country, you know. Probably a lot of them are atheists, you know. They're Catholic, uh, Reformation background, Lutheran. Uh, so I prayed for the sick, and I prayed especially for people who had growths and tumors. This is a big church. We had about 11,000 people there. And so people stood up. I just had people stand. And I prayed Psalm 107.20. I sent the word into them that heals them, delivers them from destruction. And then I said, now check yourself and see if the tumor is gone or if it's smaller. Just check yourself. This man comes running up to the platform. I didn't ask for that with a bloody handkerchief. And he told me he had a growth in his ear. And when he stood up and there was prayer, he could feel something warm on his face. And he touched it. It was blood. And he reached up and he, the growth had come out. And so he brought it in a handkerchief to me. I thought, really, I'm not collecting gross. It was a little gross. But Stephanie, that happened nine years ago. I go back to Hungary. I'm in the airport getting ready to come back to Denver. This young couple are there with a couple children and looking at me and smiling. Of course, you know, you, they're Hungarian because they don't speak much English. So the man said, do you remember me? I said, well, no, not really, but tell me the occasion. <laughs> I'm the man who brought you the growth. And he said, I am now a pastor. How sweet, how sweet that God would let me get in a situation like that. So I can tell you many, many things all over the world of healing miracles. Like one in Guatemala City, a 23-year-old man who had been injured at birth, had never walked, got out of his wheelchair, did not walk, but began to leap and we have this on video, and then began to walk. I mean, it's the name of Jesus. It's not me, it's his name. But here you live in Denver. Your, yes. your show that you're telling all these people around the world, they're all flocking to see you. And then do people just come to the church here, or they mostly want you to come to where they are? Well, I make the choices to go to these countries. I'm not always invited. <laughs> I'm inviting myself a lot of times. And of course, our church, that's the way I started as a pastor's wife. You know, and I started with home Bible studies, radio, television. So everything is a process. And I love coming home to our church. I love seeing the people you know, that go to our church, new people who come. But uh, I have a great passion for the world. Now, people are going to ask me, where is this church that she does this? Okay, it's at I-25 and Orchard Road. We bought a shopping center there. Now, my uh, son-in-law, Reese Bowling, and Sarah, my daughter, are the senior pastors. 
My husband and I are there as founding pastors. So, you know, when I'm home, I go, and sometimes I speak, and, you know, they're wonderful to me. And we flow as a family. See, I believe Jesus is for the family. And so I see my grandchildren there. It's, it's a grand thing. Well, and what's interesting, too, is it started off, what was the church called originally when you started it? Uh, well, uh, it was not called this. We, it progressed to Happy Church because we had so many Catholics who liked the worship. So they would see my husband and say, oh, you're the pastor of Happy Church. And he said, well, no, not really. I'm the pastor of Full Gospel Chapel. Oh, no, we call it Happy Church because we like the worship. And my husband came home one day and said, I think we need to change the name of the church. So it was Happy Church until we moved to Orchard Road and because of location, uh, changed the name. So it's been there for 40 years, but... Almost 50. Almost 50. Almost 50 years. We celebrate our 50th anniversary this year. Congratulations. Now yeah. that's saying something too, isn't it, right there? Because oh, yeah. most churches don't make it 50 years. Well, and I've been married 54. Most mar marriages don't make it to 54 years either. And, and your daughter is She's following 42. in your footsteps, right? Yeah. And her husband's very turned on. And of course, she wants her children. She takes her children sometimes on overseas trip. She came with me to Costa Rica and preached, and she brought Benji, the youngest the six-year-old. How do you want to be remembered, Marilyn Hickey? Uh, I want to be remembered as a woman because I don't want to be thought of as a big evangelist because really I never went to Bible school. I was a foreign language teacher. So I want to be remembered as a woman who had faith in God's Word. I want to be remembered as a radical faith woman. Someone said to me, are you a faith teacher? I said, no, no. I'm a radical faith teacher. That's the way I want to be. But you know, that kind of scares people. Do you want to scare them a little bit? Yeah. You want to shake them up? Yeah, I want to shake them up. Why, Why not? Well, because I think we just kind of lope along to accept our problems and go through life and don't have the real joy and victory and abundant life we can have in Jesus. I have abundant life. In fact, I have done more in my 70s than I did in my 30s. You know, we had a, a big crusade in Sudan, Khartoum, Sudan, when I was 76. So don't tell me what I can't do. You can do anything if you have faith. Faith is not dependent on your age, your gender. You hear what I'm saying? It's not dependent on your color. Faith is dependent on the Word of God. And when we put faith in God's Word, we put faith in Jesus. Man, that's when it cooks. It cooks big. Now, come on, you have to get discouraged sometimes and say, oh, I just can't do this today. Uh, I don't know if I get discouraged with circumstances as far as the places where I go, but sometimes when you want to do something and it takes a long time for it to happen, you get discouraged and think, well, is it going to happen? Like Ethiopia. I went to Ethiopia in 83 under communism, never had a healing meeting, and they were in a time of famine and went in and uh, did Bibles, you know, for Christians, and did food, and felt that the Lord said to me, come and have a healing meeting. I'd never even had one. And do you know, it took 19 years before that happened. So those are the kind of things, time is real serious with your faith, holding on to your faith. I got discouraged in that time. In fact, Sarah said to me, Mom, I think you've given up on Ethiopia. Is that what you're doing? It rattled my cage. Are you not a living what you teach? <laughs> and I repented of it, and then it happened. And it happened, let's see, in 2002, but it was 19 years. And then we met in a stadium and had over 40,000 people. First time a woman ever spoke in a stadium in Ethiopia, but I'm sure not the last time, you know, because that cracks barriers. Every What'd time that feel you like? crack a barrier, something else cracks for others. What that feel like standing there, 40,000 people, and you thought it wasn't going to happen? Oh, it was so wonderful. And the African people, oh, man, they are so precious and so wonderful and so responsive. And, of course, we had Muslim people, we had Orthodox people, we had atheist people, and we had dramatic miracles. So it's just a warm feeling. It, and people say, well, when you go back to your room, is it hard for you to unwind? Usually not so. Usually I go back and I am tired, you know, and I, it may take a little while, but not long. I can go to sleep because I'm not the one doing it. I have faith in Jesus and in his word. That's what makes it work, and it'll work for anyone. 
I've heard you talk about sharing your faith on all these flights yes. and how you just ask people about their life and then oh. they ask about yours and then yeah. you have a lot of really interesting conversations. It's wonderful, Stephanie. Uh, when I was going to Costa Rica, I sat by a young businessman, a lawyer actually. He was going down there on business and we talked about what he did. And then he asked me, well, what do you do? Why are you going to Costa Rica? So I told him, you know, I'm going to speak in a big conference. Uh, some of it was a women's mentoring thing, and the other was at night healing meetings. And he said, well, you know, how did you ever get into this? So we began talking, and he's Egyptian, uh, which was interesting to me. I thought he would probably be a Muslim, but he was, and he's, he's Greek Orthodox. So uh, I suppose we talked the Bible for two and a half hours. It was a wonderful time. So I just stay open, but not everybody asks you questions or want to be bothered even. But I just, if it's an open door, I take it, but I don't knock it down. Why do you call Denver your home base? Why do you originate your programs, your books, and your whole ministry out of Denver? In Denver? Uh, I was born in Texas, uh, lived in Pennsylvania until I was 16, moved to Denver at 16. So, you know, I graduated from South High. Uh, I got my degree from the University of Northern Colorado. This is home to me. And when I fly home and I land in Denver, I think, thank you, Lord, I live in Denver. I love Denver. I wouldn't want to live any other place. Yeah. I think I have a contentment, satisfaction. You do. This is just heaven for you. This is God's country, as they say. It is. I love it. I love it. What um, are your words to live by? The word I live by, uh, now this is going to sound far out. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, I speak these promises every day. I can do it today. It may look bleak. It may look black. It may look like it's never going to happen. Uh, I may wake up with bad news through the day, but I can make it. And I like this. It says we, all, he always leads us to triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now it says he leads us to win. So this is what I say. The game is not over until I win. And it says in Christ, and then it says through us, uh, there's a fragrance of knowledge that comes to other people. When people see you winning and triumphing, I'm telling you, that's winning perfume. You smell good. Uh, when, when you're always down, always losing, it just doesn't happen. That doesn't smell very good. But to see Jesus cause you to triumph, that's winning perfume. So I wear winning perfume. So when people come to church, yes. Do they come to church because everything's going great and they're happy, or do you find that they're coming in there because they're in big trouble? A lot of people come to church out of trouble. That's the way often they start. They have such needs, you know, marriage needs, uh, needs with children, uh, maybe drugs, alcohol, all kinds of things. So often they come seeking an answer, and that's really what church should be about. It should be helping people get solutions through Christ to their problems. So, and a lot of people come to church, they want to hear the word, they want to be fed, they want to be encouraged, they want to go out and meet the weak and not feel they're defeated before they go out. What does that mean they want to hear the word? Well, they want to hear the Bible and they want to hear what Jesus says that can cause them to be triumphant. Do you want to go to church and hear how bad everything is? You know, you can watch the news and hear that, but when you go to church, you need to hear the truth that bad news can be changed to good news, that God can take a lemon and make it lemonade. And we've had people divorce their mates and remarry them because of Jesus. Uh, we've had people whose children were in prison come out and be free and be strong in God. We've had business failures, big time business failures that looked like they would never come out of it who did come out of it and triumphed. So I just believe the Bible teaches a very winning message. So it attracts, it attracts losers to make them win. What's the number one prayer request or uh, phone call you get in the ministry that you do? Uh, the number one prayer request is probably for healing. Mm. I think we get more calls, more letters, more things on our website about healing. And it can be, 
healing of a broken heart, unforgiveness. Uh, it can be, you know, inside depression. Uh, so we get a lot of calls on that, a lot of requests, and it can be physical healing, and of course healing for marriages and circumstances. So healing would be the number one thing. What is your idea of a really fun night in Denver? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me this question. Uh, well, a fun night for me is to be with my family and my grandchildren and maybe take them for pizza. <laughs> and, uh, Do you have a favorite pizza spot? Uh, we have several. And, you know, and I kind of let the grandchildren pick what it is because their family takes them to places. Uh, there's one in Castle Rock that we like, uh, Gabriella's. <laughs> and so it's good and, and the kids like it. Uh, another thing, um, just a fun night, is if I, I can have them all over for dinner, I like to cook. Cooking is kind of relaxing to me. And what do you like to cook? Uh, I like to cook everything. I like to cook German food. Uh, I cook Italian food, Mexican food. Of course, living in Denver, what's better than the green chilies we get here? <laughs> and so I like to cook Mexican food. But it's very fun uh, to feed my family. That's a nice evening. When my grandchildren were little, Sarah would say, can you come over and help me give them a bath? Because she had three little ones. And that was fun to me. And I would tell them Bible stories while they were in the bathtub. So they call me Mimi. Mimi, tell us a story we haven't heard, you know. Uh, what is your greatest blessing? Uh, my greatest blessing, that I have so many. Uh, I think I'm very blessed to have a husband like I've had that uh, was uh, not uh, competitive with me and encouraged me in everything I, and really thinks I'm better than I am. <laughs> I'm not as good as he says. I think having children, you know, I have one adopted son and I have Sarah and uh, having grandchildren, uh, that's a tremendous blessing. I think having good health, really good health, is a big blessing. You have no physical ailments? No. I don't. I, I think, and I exercise. Uh, I try to drink enough water, you know. I uh, try to eat properly. I don't always do it all right. Uh, I try to get enough sleep. I'm a nap person. I take naps, especially if I want to preach at night. That nap just kind of perks me up and puts me over. But I think you get one body, Stephanie, for this life. You better take care of what you get. I agree. You know. uh, well, but there's also something else going on with you. I, I can't <laughs> put my finger on it. But if you could do anything else professionally, what would you do? Anything else professionally? Oh, I'd probably teach because I like teaching so well. I just, I love teaching. I love teaching in high school. I love teaching in junior high. I like the bad kids. You know, in our Bible study on Friday night, there's a girl I had in junior high Bible uh, in junior high school. She is in our Friday night. She told me the other night, do you remember me? And I thought, no, I don't remember you. Well, I'm Janet so-and-so. I was in your Bible study when you taught school at Grant Junior High. I love teaching. It's great. What's your favorite sound? Favorite town? Sound. Sound. What is your favorite sound? Um, now, Stephanie, I love classical music. So, you know, I have my station on classical music a lot. I like that. Uh, I like worship music. Hillsong is a very popular one from Australia. Uh, so I like worship music. Uh, probably my favorite sounds are worship music. You know? um, what is your favorite restaurant in Denver? Uh, that changes. I like P.F. Chang real well. <laughs> I like Maggiano's. You know? uh, there's a, a restaurant uh, on Orchard, right off of Orchard, called Venice. that has wonderful Italian food. And probably I take guests there the most. Do you want to go with me? I'd love to. <laughs> I'll take you. OK. What is the one thing that annoys you about people? About people? Uh, I think uh, when people are crude and uncouth, you know, I think anybody can have a decent disposition. You know, when you see people be harsh and cruel, and sometimes I see it on airplanes, people are harsh to the stewardess. I think, come on, they're waiting on us. What's your problem here? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think that kind of crudeness bothers me. I don't like it. And I think it's unnecessary, even if the service is not good. Give me a break. You know, 
anybody can be gracious. We can say thank you. What an easy way to get along with people. Just saying thank you. What's the one word that sums you up both professionally and personally? Probably faith. I would think that. You think so? What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? I think you that know. might be an understatement. Really? Yeah. How long have you known me? Three years? I think so, yeah. What would you say? You've seen me at church a lot. You haven't been overseas with me. I would say um, loves God. But oh, that's I not do. one word, so. Yeah, I do love him. Yeah, no yeah, question. Yeah, I would say love God. No question. Coolest person you know in Denver? Coolest person I know in Denver? Uh, oh, oh, oh. Now, see, I'm going to go back to family again. Probably the coolest person to me is Sarah, you know? I mean, she's like a best friend to me, you know? Uh, probably uh, she's the coolest one I know. And you two do a show together. We do a daily program together. And it's called? Just, Today with Marilyn and Sarah. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to do. I mean, People she, watch it all over the world. Yeah, and she comes in, and it's like a hand in a glove. She'll say, you know, I feel led to do this, and I will already have written down this, what I feel to do. I mean, that's miraculous. So how good God is to me. And she always said to me, I will never do what you do. I said, I don't want you to do what I do. I want you to do what God wants you to do. Well, she said, I'm going to be an astronaut. I said, well, help yourself. We'll help you. But at 25, she had a dramatic call into the ministry unanticipated by my husband or me. We never dreamed she'd do what she's doing. Well, because she was rebellious and thought you two were over the top, right? Well, she went through a period like that, yeah. I think I was an embarrassment to her. You know? Oh, my mother, the evangelist. But, you know, that, some of that is just processed with kids. You just love them through it. Don't get nervous. I could eat blank every day of the week. Oh, my. <laughs> I could eat blank every day of the week. Uh, I really like black beans. You get those a lot in Central and South America. I really like hummus, baba ganoush, the uh, Mideast food. I really, really like that. Um, I don't want to say this. I like spaghetti and meatballs really well, but that is so bad for you for weight. Ugh. So <laughs> some of these things you just have to make choices when you eat them and how often. One piece of advice you wish to pass along. Uh, keep a positive attitude, no matter how bad your situation is. Keep a positive attitude. Uh, our son called us, called me when I was 16 and said, Mom, uh, I'm into drugs and I like it and you're not going to stop me. Uh, you know, at first you want to go kill him. You know, you think I put all this in you. And, but some way you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. And uh, if you can, in all these circumstances, believe that God can bring you through. And he did come through and got free from drugs. But it was a period of time. It was like nine years before he really got through. Do you think you've pretty much experienced it all, or do you, do you still have the best years ahead? I believe every day is a gift, you know. And so when I got up this morning, I thanked God for this day and that I get to be with you, get to have this program. So I look at every day as being a gift. Uh, my son-in-law gives me a hard time about this because I, he'll say, when do you, you think you'll quit ministering? I said, well, maybe in five years, you know, maybe, maybe when I'm 83. He said, Marilyn, you say it every year. You just had another year. So you know, I want to uh, minister, especially travel in ministry because of the needs, as long as I have the energy to do it. So I pray that when my energy runs out, God just takes me home. Now, of all the places that you've traveled in the world, do you have a very favorite? Yes. What? China. I've been to China 31 times. I love China. It's almost like China is in my heart. And we were just there in October. Sarah loves it too. In fact, Sarah speaks some Chinese. You know, she can get by. I don't know any Chinese. But some way, I love China. It's so big so vast, so many different cultures. Oh, a lot of different cultures. But there's something about China that always attracts me. Any place you haven't been, you want to go to? Oh, yes. A lot of them. Algeria. 
I would love to have a Why? He healing meeting in Algeria because it hasn't happened in 1400 years. I would like to go to Algeria and have a healing meeting. You know, I've applied for a visa. It took three years. They said, well, what do you do? I said, uh, well, I'm a tourist. They said, you're not a tourist. We know who you are. <laughs> we don't want you in here. But after three years, they've said, yes, but to go and do a meeting, that would be a biggie. Uh, I would like to do something in Libya. I haven't done anything in Libya. Uh, Why Libya? Because no one has done anything. I like to go places where nobody has done it. I'm talking about Christian meetings. Now, Egypt, we did a big meeting in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, this would be a year and a half ago. And probably we'll go back and do another one. We had 9,000 people come in Cairo, Egypt. How do they find out that you're coming? Oh, we advertise it. We do everything. Uh, we, we send people to set it up. It's nothing by accident. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of planning, a lot of prayer, a lot of everything. And then we also do something for leaders, Christian leaders. So we'll take a day, we'll put books in their language, Arabic. We, books are like missionaries. When you leave books in their language, we don't understand that, but they don't have access to Christian books. So uh, I like to do that. I like to leave something lasting. What do you think Jesus is going to say to you when you finally meet him? Uh, well, hopefully what the Bible says, well, I've done that good and faithful servant and not, uh, well, you blew it at the end. I don't want to blow it at the end. I want to go all the way. <laughs> do you have any idea of what that would be like? For him to say that? To meet him. To meet him? Uh, no. I'm reading a book on heaven right now by Randy Alcorn. It's a really, really good book, and it's really provoked me to look at more scriptures about heaven. Uh, I don't know. It must be so glorious. Uh, I really uh, believe our loved ones who have Jesus uh, know what's going on here with us and pray for us. You do? I do. And, of course, I have loved ones over there. The Bible says with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when they died, they were gathered to their people. So I think those people w await us. What's your very favorite story of all the places that you've been and all the people that you've met? Favorite story? Uh, you're just talking about an experience with people. Mm -hmm. Experience with people? Mm -hmm. Oh, Stephanie, that's so hard because I, I have to think of which country and what went on. Um, I think uh, Pakistan would be my favorite one, and that would be 2003. And, you know, we have that DVD of that. And that was when they were burning the American flag in the streets and ordered all Americans out, you know, and President Bush was not popular. And here we have a meeting and a stadium is filled with 120,000 people. We had dog sniffing dogs who went in and, you know, I mean, every person who came in was checked for anything. My hotel, I had a man with a gun outside my door for 24 hours. They changed people, of course. Uh, but seeing what God did in that time, uh, I wouldn't mind reliving that. That was so wonderful. Because you didn't have any problems? You walked right in, did your thing? and uh, I, I had no problems. No, I didn't have any crisis, but we did a lot of security things, and that cost lots of money. I mean, these meetings are not little. You don't just show up and show off. And you it's know. just you and Sarah standing up there? No, Sarah didn't even go on this one. She doesn't always go with me. Uh, I was the only one. Sarah, see, that had been 2003, so her children would have been young. Uh, sometimes she goes with me. Sometimes she does her own. You know, she's going to Ethiopia and doing a big meeting there and did one. Uh, she's very concerned about Cambodia, and we've done some big meetings in Cambodia, Phnom Penh. A lot of young people there. Almost all of them are under 30 because of, you know, the terrible thing that went on in the government. Is there anything that I'm missing that you would like to share? Anything. I would just like to share that uh, God loves people. He really loves people, and he loves people just like they are. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, my attitude can be bad. I can do a wrong thing. But he loves me. That's the bottom line. If we can see that we have a Heavenly Father who really loves us and made a provision for us, through Jesus Christ, that we can come to Him. You know, we talk religions. The only religion that has redemption in it, a way to get free of sin 
and go to the Father is Christianity. And that's why I say it's not a religion. And you said that too. It's a relationship. I would just say to people, you need to experience Christ. And I've said to people sometimes, well, I don't know if I want to do that. I said, well, why don't you pray and just see? What could it hurt if you prayed the prayer? You know, what could it hurt? Could it transform your life forever? And it will.